Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were three gables, five orange pips, and a sign of four, but there are hundreds of other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about how much money Holmes actually collected from the Duke of Holderness? Or why Watson constantly had to read the telegrams to him? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 248, Plotting Lovers. Hello once again and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you are you plotting your revenge in this episode? Oh no, no. I I've moved so far <laughs> past plotting my revenge. I spend most of my free time, you know, thinking about uh embezzlement, other forms of manipulation, um hot wiring cars. Oh, Everybody good. needs a hobby. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to uh, refer to you from now on by your street name, uh, which is uh, it's associated with the racketeering and uh, influence corrupt organizations. I'm calling you Rico Suave. <laughs> oh, that's a lot better than what I thought you were going to call me. I thought you were going to call me Senator. <laughs> good, good God. Oh, I, I would never sink that low. Well, uh, let's sink to the level of uh, homework here and send you over to ihos.co slash trifles248, all lowercase. That'll be the show notes for this episode, which will pull up all of our uh, potential links, uh, things we have to say, uh, even an audio player, if you'd prefer to listen to us right there on the web. Of course, you can find us in any podcast listening app and just make sure you are subscribed to us there. And what the heck, why don't you subscribe to us via email on our website as well? That way, you'll get a note every Wednesday or Thursday when the show launches. It'll actually be Thursday. That's a secret. I haven't told (laughs) anyone so far. The email goes out on Thursday, but the show drops on Wednesday. So if you are subscribed to us on any of the major podcast players, or if you are a Patreon supporter, you will find out about our latest episode before anyone else. So, shh, don't tell anyone. (laughs) Well, we are talking about the pleasant topic of plotting lovers. Uh, We kind of got into this a little while ago. I think it was in episode 245, where we talked about uh, Maria... Uh, Maria Gibson, nay Pinto, right. uh, from Thor Bridge. And we, we kind of put out there that we, what if this was actually a plan on her part? Um, or, or actually, no, we, we said, what if it was a plan on uh, Neil Gibson's part and wasn't a plan on Maria Pinto's part, Maria Pinto Gibson's part? Um, but we thought we would turn our attention to Another story where a similar kind of setup occurs, a love triangle. And and we've talked about love triangles before uh, here on Trifles. It's nothing new. I think it's um, uh, really one of the oldest things. We, we hear about love triangles going as far back as, oh, well, I mean, look at the Bible. You know, uh, King David was lusting after uh, Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba, and sent... Uh, sent Uriah out into the front line of battle so he'd be killed. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of uh, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame goes along <laughs> with uh, setting someone up like that. And the guilt and shame aspect of uh, adultery or perceived adultery was uh, certainly something that was happening uh, in the Victorian era. 
You know, there, there was no, um, there was no great badge that one could wear, uh, with regard to adultery. As a matter of fact, in the United States, in the, in the mid 1800s, you had the Nathaniel Hawthorne, write The Scarlet Letter, which of course took place in Salem in the late 1600s in, in the USA. Uh, but it was also about the great shame regarding adultery. So it wasn't something that was as widely discussed uh, in those days as it might be, say, uh, today. N- not that it's a, a great badge of honor today, but I don't think there's the kind of um, ostracization that, that uh, might go on. Uh, you, you wouldn't be kind of thrown out of society or... Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't wear that scarlet letter uh, these days. Hmm. Well, no, particularly if you don't have a hat that uh, compliments. It. <laughs> I thought it was just pinned on, like uh, you know, take me to to bus number twelve at the end of kindergarten. No, that's Paddington. That's the tag that says, "Please look after this." Oh, bit. that's <laughs> and only only Aunt Lucy gets to do that. There you go. Well, we, of course, uh, we, we run into uh, the love triangle, a deadly love triangle in the cardboard box. Uh, Jim Browner uh, married to Sarah Cushing, and um, he is away for uh, quite a bit of time, and he takes to drink. And Sarah's sister, Susan, poisons her mind against him because Susan has a thing for Browner. And in the meantime... Uh, along comes uh, a young sailor who is, uh, well, a lot younger than Browner, a lot more charming, and uh, grabs the attentions of uh, the young Mrs. Browner. And Jim finds out about it and ends up killing them both. It was a horrific, horrific uh, tale. So bad, in fact, that it was actually omitted from the book collected version of the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes and not inserted into uh, the book format until was it was it his last bow that it appeared in well it was it wasn't in the case book a case book was it case book I don't recall but but the bottom line is it was it was basically out of print for about oh, 20 years or so um, because it was not fit for consumption by polite society well i think the reason for that primarily was the grotesque grotesque aspect of someone receiving a severed human ear in the post rather well, than well to the, the morality a cudgel to the yeah, head no, yeah. that's, that's true the morality of it was a uh, yeah well not i mean it wasn't really even proven to be adultery it was just um you know the double murder of your your wife and uh, her intended um, there was a lot of a lot of horrific stuff in there, but anyway, that was another example of a um, a love triangle that uh, Holmes had to deal with. But the one that we are really interested in today is from the Abbey Grange. So, yes. Bert, set us up with the Abbey Grange how we how we find out about this and um, and what's going on there. Well, we find out about this as Sherlock Holmes receives a note from um, Inspector Hopkins, if I remember correctly. Hopkins um, writes to Holmes at 3.30 in the morning and says, I should be very glad of your immediate assistance in what promises to be a most remarkable case and Holmes says Hopkins has called me in separate seven times, and on each occasion his summons has been entirely justified. So um, we have, um, you know, sort of a quick review of the um, uh, case, the facts, and we encounter Inspector Hopkins, and we hear about a Lewisham gang of burglars. But what's going on here is Sir Eustace Brackenstall has been murdered. And we quickly get to the wife of Sir Eustace Brackenstall and Lady Brackenstall. And this is another lovely thing early in the story where Watson is clearly bowled over in an, in an enormous way by Lady Brackenstall. Lady Brackenstall, he says, the very first thing he says was no ordinary person. Seldom have I seen so graceful a figure. 
so womanly a presence and so beautiful a face. I mean, Watson walks into the room, pulls up a chair and is just gobsmacked. She was a blonde, golden haired, blue eyed and would no doubt have been have had the perfect complex complexion, which goes with such coloring, had not her recent experience left her drawn and haggard. And her sufferings were physical as well as mental. She's got this big wound over her eye. And uh, she's exhausted, but Watson can tell her quick observant gaze as we entered the room and the alert expression of her beautiful features showed that neither her wits nor her courage had been shaken by her terrible experience. And she was enveloped in a loose dressing gown, a blue, not a tight dressing gown at all, a loose dressing gown of blue and silver. Well, Watson is just, <laughs> Watson is off to the races when he sees Lady Bracken's tall. She stood in front of the gaslight as I admired her figure through the flowing <laughs> dressing gown. Now, um, yeah, I mean, clearly here, and and this isn't just a fault of uh, of Watson. I mean, Watson really represents uh, the common man, um, and and Holmes never uh, allows uh, the the physical characteristics of someone to cloud his judgment about what uh, what they might be all about. I mean, you recall that in the play, the Crucifer of Blood, uh, mm. which. Uh, Gosh, I forget who. I forget oh, I who wrote that. Don't, don't remember. I know Charlton Heston was in uh, the HBO version of it. Paxton Whitehead played Sherlock Holmes yes. on stage. But um, yes. here you had um, a young Mrs. Uh, oh, was it Sinclair? I think that was the name they chose. It was. It was a combination of about four different Sherlock Holmes stories. But Watson was was struck with her beauty in very much the same way he was with Lady Brackenstall, very similar physical uh, description. And and in the end, she ended up turning out to be the villain of the story. And uh, here was Watson simply being bamboozled uh, by the, the great female form or the great female beauty. And this is something yes. that Holmes tried to avoid. But we know that... Uh, in Holmes's case, they almost got away with it. Th this was an instance where the Lewisham Bank gang really didn't uh, didn't fit the mold of what they were what they were trying to say because Holmes looked at the uh, the wine glasses, right? And it was that it, it, the combination of the wine glasses and the bell pull being cut with a knife. Um, and Holmes deduced who it might be that would have had the motive and the means to do something like this. So the wine glasses told him that there were um, three people present, not two, if I recall, because they poured three glasses and the remnants of the two were poured into the third. Um, right. And this was to, to make it uh, look like... Um, I think that that um, what was it that three people had or that two? What were they trying to? What were they trying to uh, give the impression of? I think the three were there. The three, the three. Oh yeah, the three members of the Lewisham bank. Yeah. And okay, so yeah, because to me, this was the great the great failure in their plotting, because Holmes figured it, it was uh, it was Crocker and Lady Mary that ended up drinking the wine. And they took right. the dregs from those two glasses and they poured it into the third to make it look like three people had drunk. Well, Teresa, the maid, was right there. Why didn't she have a glass of wine with the two of them so it would oh, be she... an airtight alibi? Well, wait a minute. She's the maid. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you may want to get away with the fact that you're... Your rat, and we should t explain to our listeners who haven't read Abby Grange recently. What's going on here is the reason we have this magnificent introduction of Lady Brackenstall and her great beauty is that she's been cruelly, cruelly treated. The first, almost the first words out of her mouth to Sherlock Holmes when he turns up on the scene is, I'm the wife of Sir Eustace, and I have been married about a year. Now, that's pretty interesting. She's 
She's put up with this guy. She says immediately, our marriage was not a happy one. And our neighbors would tell you, even if I tried to obscure that, and maybe it's me. She says, you know, I was brought up in South Australia. And this English life with all of its proprieties and its primness is not congenial to me. But the main reason lies in one fact, which is which everybody knows, which is Sir Eustace was a confirmed, by the way, not just occasional, not just regular, not just consistent, confirmed. So he devoted a lot of thought to this. He was a confirmed drunkard. Um, <laughs> and he, he uh, phys- was in the habit of physically abusing her uh, and his general general surroundings. Now, how come this never tumbled to her before she married him is something else again. But uh, that's that's the deal. And then Captain Croker comes and she turns out he had fallen in love with her before she married Sir Eustace and he's basically come to rescue her. And it was in this altercation that, uh, that Sir Eustace uh, pegged out. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this beast of a husband also set her dog on fire. Uh, is one of the uh, abusive uh, moments there. So you know, is clearly not a, not a very nice man. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 what's happened is there's a burglary gang, and that's been a real n- notable thing in the in the uh, local news and the local gossip and communication. And so when this happens to Sir Eustace during this altercation, they try to pin this on this burglary gang. Correct. Correct. And, and of course, Holmes uh, figures it out. He sees the, the rope cut. He sees the nautical knots tied uh, on um, uh, Lady Mary on the chair. He uh, sees the three glasses, and he says, ah, this couldn't have been the, the gang. It was, uh, it was the, the two of you, so come clean. And they yeah. came clean and, uh, you know, basically got a, a year's penance uh, only to resume their lives afterwards. But... But there may have been a sick twist to all of us. We'll get into exactly what that was right after this word. In 2021. The Baker Street Journal continues to be the leading Sherlockian publication since its founding in 1946 by Edgar W. Smith. In its pages, you'll find both serious scholarship and articles that play the game. The journal is essential reading for anyone interested in Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and a world where it's always 1895. If you subscribe to the Baker Street Journal, you'll get four quarterly issues as well as the Christmas Annual. You don't have to be a member of the BSI or of any Sherlockian society, for that matter, to subscribe to the journal. It's open to anyone who enjoys talking about, reading about, and writing about Sherlock Holmes. And you can also contribute to the BSJ. Your imagination is the only limitation there. So get on the bandwagon and subscribe to the Baker Street Journal this year. Make it an important part of your commitment to the world of Sherlock Holmes. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and subscribe today. All right, uh, let's continue our conversation about what happened between Captain Crocker and Lady Mary. Now, this is inspired by an essay written by Bob Byrne, in Baker Street Essays. We'll have a link to uh, the PDF of that particular uh, volume on some thoughts regarding the Abbey Grange. He asks, was Holmes duped? Could not the facts be looked at with different motives leading to an alternate conclusion? What reader familiar with today's television drama or even Columbo episodes of the 1970s couldn't envision a different story? Yeah, And he says, yeah, suppose that... Um, Mary and Captain Crocker actually began a relationship on the ship, on her journey from Australia to England. Now, they were single people at that point. Um, they, they weren't engaged, so there really wasn't anything scandalous going on there. But if they continued the affair, even uh, as Mary pledging her uh, pledged her affections to Sir Eustace, how many romantic assignations did they have? In the interim, did Mary's attitude towards her husband turn colder? And Bob references Jim Browner 
in the cardboard box and, and says, uh, like Jim Browner, did Sir Eustace increase his drinking? And then the state of his marriage uh, begin uh, deteriorating as a result. Yeah. Well, it's a very good point. And we know that Sir Eustace is, I think, from Stanley Hopkins' early introduction, that uh, Sir Eustace is one of the wealthiest, somewhere along the line, Stanley uh, Hopkins describes him as being very well off. Um, you know, Watson, Holmes looks at the, the paper that Stanley Hopkins has written on and says we're moving in high life, Watson, you know, because of the quality of this paper. So, oh, that's right. One of the richest men in Kent, says um, mm. Stanley Hopkins early on. So it could be, you know, now that Sir Eustace is no more, it could well be, we don't know, but it could well be that Lady Mary is the beneficiary of this and that um, she and Captain Croker, Crocker were eager to have... Um, that transfer of wealth happens sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, as Bob states, uh, Mary, now Lady Brackenstall, is likely uh, the principal heir to the significant fortune. Only Sir Eustace's annoying habit of being alive stands in the way, <laughs> stands in the way of their being together and also of being very rich. The divorce laws of the day are no help. If they can kill Sir Eustace and make it appear that it was an accident or completely shift the blame away from Mary, their happiness would be assured. And, of course, Teresa is the only one who uh, knows the truth. So they plan, then, to, to make the gang the scapegoat of, uh, of the murder, and, uh, and, and they, they set it up. So you've got you've got Sir Eustace who is unable to defend himself in the end defend his reputation and they can paint him however they want um, as a result and make it clear that uh, you know that while while they in fact caused his death uh, they were uh, less culpable than might otherwise be expected in a situation like that well, yes, and it's useful to spend a moment and just think about the role of Teresa here, because like, I believe the name was, was that Marlo Bates in Thor Bridge? Yes. The, um, the, the state, manager. he was the manager, not That's the secretary, right. the manager, who makes an appearance before Sherlock Holmes and describes how vile Neil Gibson has right. been treating his wife. Well, we have a similar character here in Teresa, because Crapton Crocker tells us, Teresa was always my friend, for she loved Mary and hated this villain almost as much as I did. Mm. And as soon as Sir Eustace is dead, Teresa, says Captain Crocker, was as cool as ice. And it was her plot as much as mine. Mm. So here, you know, you've got Teresa Wright, her old maid. And that tells us, of course, that Teresa has been with Lady Mary before she was Lady Mary. So she has, you know, this long association with Lady Mary. And she's clearly an unindicted co-conspirator. Indeed she was. And so there was the Teresa Wright before arriving in England. There was the Teresa Wright after arriving in England, and uh, who very clearly plotted this whole thing out, uh, proving the point that two rights make a wrong. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. <laughs> Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. And you observed, of course, how she maneuvered to have her back to the light. She did not wish us to read her expression too closely. Yes, yeah, she chose that chair in the whole room. And yet the motives of women are so inscrutable. I mean, how can you build on such a quicksand? Their most trivial action may mean volumes, or their most extraordinary conduct may depend upon a hairpin or a curling torch.